In the lobby, wearing all black with a buzz cut, Ian Malcolm plays pool skillfully, using lots of carom shots. Ah, uh, you finally arrived. You must be Alan Grant and uh, Ellie Sattler. Ian Malcolm. That's a familiar name, Grant says, shaking his hand. I'm a chaotician. That's what they call us. Mathematicians who study chaos theory. Did Hammond bring you here too? Yes, I was surprised he did. I consulted on this project years ago. Told him then this island would be a disaster. A disaster? Oh yes. This island's a disaster. No question about it. Chaos theory says so. I don't really know what chaos theory is. It's not difficult to understand. Malcolm pauses, looking around. Uh, look out the window. Outside, Lex and Tim play catch by the artificial waterfall that bubbles down to the swimming pool. Clouds fill the sky beyond. When you look at the world, you see two kinds of phenomena. One is the regular movement of objects, like that ball. Mathematics deals with regular movement very well. We can predict the movement of the planets, we can send the spaceships to the moon, all that, right? Right. But there is another kind of movement in the world, and it's not regular at all. Look at the clouds in the sky, how they change. Look at the waterfall, how it bubbles and churns in the pool. That movement is swirling, changing, unpredictable. Okay. But now, chaos theory allows us to understand waterfalls and clouds. Huh. And what does a cloud have to do with my island? Hammond demands, entering the room. Nothing. But chaos theory says your island is uncontrollable. Huh. It's not. I promise you, it is. Complex nonlinear systems are sensitive to initial conditions and therefore unpredictable. You might as well ask where that pedal in the waterfall will end up. It's absolutely unpredictable and uncontrollable. And so is this island, Mr. Hammond. Uncontrollable. <laughs> Wrong again, Ian. I'll show you why. Are we all ready for the tour? Two land cruisers enter a gate and come to a stop before the long steps leading to the visitor center. Its exterior and landscaping are still unfinished. Hammond and Regis lead the group out of the cars and up the steps. Lex plays with her scorched wall. Our visitor center isn't finished yet, but when it is, it will serve the education functions of the park. They enter the visitor center rotunda to record dinosaur roars. The interior is large, elegant, and unfinished decorated with dinosaur skeletons, scaffolding still around them. In the center of the large rotunda, the top half of a Tyrannosaurus rex skeleton is being swung and then lowered by a series of cables hung from above. Another skeleton of an herbivore trying to flee is already in place. Grant takes a step towards this display. This complete Tyrannosaurus rex was found in Wyoming three years ago. Is this the secret you were talking about? Hammond smiles <laughs> and shakes his head no. Uh, then he addresses his guests. Dinosaurs were once a great mystery. That's what has attracted us to them. That we didn't know everything and that we're always trying to discover the answers. He gestures the group around the skeletal display. But now we've discovered the answers. They're here, in flesh and blood for all to see. Grant and Ellie look out at the T-Rex skeleton swinging over the top of the herbivore into an attacking position. What is he talking about? Grant whispers to Ellie. Before Ellie can respond, Hammond directs his next words to Grant. Wouldn't you like to see these animals as they actually are? rather than sit out in the desert and theorize about the unknowable world of prehistoric dinosaurs? I don't see how that's possible. Let me just put it to you this way. What I am going to show you is going to make obsolete 
the entire scientific field of paleontology. There will be no reason for it to exist at all. They head into an unfinished display area titled, Extinction is a Thing of the Past. The group sits down in padded seats inside the theater. The room lights go down. Hammond smiles in the dark at Grant whispering intensely to Ellie and Malcolm. Our show is aimed at the young audience, but you'll get the general idea. On a giant screen, the video begins with an introduction by Hammond, sounding not entirely unlike Walt Disney. Behind him, there are illustrations of dinosaurs. Ladies and gentlemen, and children of all ages, welcome to Jurassic Park. Grant frowns at the name Jurassic Park. The first thing most people want to know about is how we made these mighty creatures of the past. Let me tell you about the fantastic genetic process we've used to recreate actual living examples of full-sized dinosaurs. What? Grant suddenly sits forward, startled. The process actually started over 65 million years ago when dinosaurs ruled the Earth. As the camera flies over a computer-generated prehistoric landscape, Hammond narrates the sequence. A buzzing fly moves towards a herd of grazing hadrosaurs. Suddenly, they all start running as they are pursued by a fierce Tyrannosaurus Rex. After the large carnivore makes its kill, the fly buzzes right into its eye. When the fly bites the Tyrannosaurus, it roars. It flies off until it lands on a tree, where it is trapped in amber sap. Eventually, it stops struggling. Stuck in the sap, it eventually becomes amber. The fly trapped inside. The CG video ends and a series of still images depict Hammond's narration. We drilled into the amber, then into the insect's stomach. Very carefully, And sometimes, we found blood, which we analyze in our high-end computers. And once in a while, it turns out to be blood from a dinosaur. We clone the DNA in our laboratories and grew it in our special hatcheries. The still images shift to video. And out came a baby dinosaur to live here in Jurassic Park. The video ends with a wide CG panoramic view of the island. Then the lights come on. Malcolm is the first to speak. Uh, Shouldn't we have a more technical discussion from the person who actually did it? Our chief geneticist, Dr. Wu, can show you the actual labs. The group enters the extraction lab, the first of several arranged like spokes of a wheel. Henry Wu, 35 with a cool and precise attitude, stands in a white lab coat, proud of his astonishing accomplishment. He begins to speak. Our work to obtain dinosaur DNA begins here with physical extraction from amber. Behind glass, a display of screens is set up for visitors. In the back, we see part of the lab itself, technicians moving and working. The screens show scanning microscope imagery in black and white. Wu speaks rapidly, unabashedly technical. Using Levine Loy antibody technique, a method sensitive to the presence of only 50 nanograms of protein material. If the insect thoracic cavity contains saurian DNA, we'll recover it here. Next. A computer display screen on the inner side of the rotunda shows high-speed analysis of DNA code. Our three Cray XMP supercomputers analyze the code, and Hamachi Hood automated sequencers form the nucleotides in the correct order. Needless to say, we could never do this work without computers. Inside the fertilization lab, technicians carry trays among complex equipment. There's elaborate security with barred sections, double doors, and security locks with keypads. 
One technician enters a walk-in freezer carrying a portable incubator. We fertilize here, then freeze the embryos until we need them. We keep them locked in the freezer. Looks like a bank vault. With reason. Wu points to the embryos. Each dinosaur embryo is worth two million dollars to another genetics company, if they could get their hands on one. We have elaborate security. We want to keep our dinosaurs right here in Jurassic Park. The hatchery is filled with warm, infrared light. Nestled eggs rock on tables covered in mist. Wu continues his tour. When it's time, we insert the DNA into plastic eggs and grow them here in the hatchery. How long does it take them to grow? Three months until they hatch. They attain adulthood two to four years after that, depending on the species. And uh, how many species do you have? I lose track. Fifteen, I believe. Malcolm looks on in disbelief. You lose track? Well, sometimes a species has to go back to the drawing board, so to speak, and we correct their DNA. Grant frowns. Back to the drawing boards? Regis interrupts. Perhaps you'll show them an actual dinosaur, Dr. Wu. Yes. That is, if you'd like to see one of our babies. At the lab security entrance, Dr. Wu puts his hand on a pad unlocking the door. The group follows him in. Later, Wu leads the group, all dressed in sterile clothes, into the nursery. In the center of the room is a circular plexiglass cage. Inside are blankets, towels, and a couple well-worn stuffed toys. Wu taps on the glass, and a bird-like head of a baby velociraptor pokes up. Jeez. Velociraptor. Yes, just two weeks old. It looks like a baby bird. You're right, Lex. These are the ancestors of the birds of today. The raptor is chirping almost like a bird. Wu opens the lid and reaches in. Suddenly, the baby raptor's legs scramble up his arm, across his back, and it perches on Lex's shoulder. Hey! The baby raptor jumps to the floor. Everyone goes to their knees to find it amongst the cages lining the walls. The babies can jump. So can the adults. Tim finds the baby and coaxes it forward. He gently takes it in his arms. The raptor chirps content. Will he hurt me? She. No. She's friendly. Are you sure it's safe? Oh, yes. The babies don't have teeth. They can't even break out of their eggs without the help of the nursery staff. Grant turns to Tim, who hands the baby raptor to him. He examines the baby raptor carefully. How do they get along with the babies in the wild? In the wild? Yes when the raptors breed in the wild. Oh, they never do. The animals in Jurassic Park can't breed. Why not? Very simple. They're all female. All female? Um, I wonder, is that checked? Does anyone actually uh, go out and lift up the dinosaur skirts to have a look? How does one determine the sex of a dinosaur anyway? Sex organs vary with species. On the velociraptors, it's actually quite difficult. You'll notice, Dr. Grant, a very small cloacal opening ventrally. Wu turns back to Malcolm. But to answer your question, Dr. Malcolm, we know all the animals are female because we grow them that way. Believe me, the dinosaurs can't breathe. The velociraptor rubs her head against Grant's neck. Grant hands her to Ellie. Fascinating. You are persuaded? Let's say you've got my attention. Are there any adult raptors? Oh yes, several. But they're not on the tour. Oh. Why is that? We haven't finished their habitat yet. So they're still in the holding pen. Now I think it's time for us to go to the control room so you can see how we keep track of the dinosaurs once they grow up. The control room is a cross between a carrier flight deck and a miniature mission control. Clusters of monitors, screens, and vertical glowing displays break the dim light. Dominating the center of the room is a large tabletop model of the park, animated with inch-high dinosaurs. Wow! This is the nerve center of Jurassic Park. Regis explains. It's designed to be operated by just one or two people. And this is our chief engineer, John Arnold. John, you want to tell our visitors about the control mechanisms in the park? John Arnold, a lean, chain-smoking man of 45 in shirt sleeves, turns to the group. Well, sure, Ed. As you can imagine, these are very valuable animals. We take very good care of them, and we try to keep very careful track of them. Let me demonstrate. Name an animal. Tim shrugs, absently. Tyrannosaurus Rex? 
you have a Tyrannosaurus Rex here. Of course. Can't very well have a dinosaur park without a Tyrannosaurus Rex. How big is he? <laughs> big. Arnold presses buttons. The vertical glass map glows with a park outline. A blinking spot and code numbers appear by the lagoon. Simultaneously, the T-Rex figure lights up on the model. Well, there's our T-Rex over by the lagoon now. He tends to stay close to the water. You have a Triceratops too? Show him, John. Hammond gives Arnold a knowing look. Oh, I'll show him every animal in the park. The map lights up like a Christmas tree. Dozens of spots of light, each with a code number. That's the current location of all 238 dinosaurs. Accurate within five feet. Updated every 30 seconds. The computer screen shows a tally. Total animals, 238. Very impressive. How's it done? We have motion sensors all over the park, and we get direct image recognition off video monitors. Even when we're not watching, the computer is. Keeping track where all the animals are. So the animals roam freely? Oh, absolutely not. Arnold motions to the vertical glass map of the island. As in a zoo, we contain our animals with a combination of concrete moats, orange bars light up the board, and electric fences. Bright red lines show up. All of our fences carry 10,000 volts. The animals know not to go near them. But you control everything from here? I can run the entire park from this computer by myself. As a matter of fact, I need only 20 people to operate this whole island. Hell of a goddamn system. It was designed by Dennis Nedry here, our chief programmer. Dennis Nedry, a chubby, nerdy, and messy man of 35, sits at a corner terminal, surrounded by candy bar wrappers and Coke cans. Ian leans over Nedry's shoulder, staring at his computer screen. And what are you doing now? Just cleaning up a few final bugs. What kind of bugs? Arnold steps in. In a big computer system, there are bound to be a few. We want it to be perfect. It really is a hell of a system. Regis interjects. Now, I see the tour is starting, so unless you have other questions, let's go see dinosaurs. The group emerges from the lab security door and heads towards the lobby and main entrance. Hammond walks between Grant and Ellie. Now do you see why you two are suddenly out of a job? What do you mean? Who's going to be interested in the study of a bunch of old bones when they can see the real animals for themselves? Grant has no reply. Hammond puts his hand on Grant's shoulder. Don't take it too hard. As I told you, I have plans for both of you here. After all, it was you and Ellie who provided many of the studies we use to care for these great creatures. Does it concern you that you may be a bit like Dr. Frankenstein? <laughs> oh, come on now. I'm not Dr. Frankenstein. <laughs> to bring back human beings is illegal. What I am doing with dinosaurs is legal, harmless, and fun. He turns to Grant and Ellie. Actually, all of this is just phase one. Hammond pauses at the entrance to look out over his island. In the next phase, I will create the antidote for all of the environmental problems man has created for endangered species. Using the same process of DNA cloning, no animal ever needs to become extinct again. We are going to build parks on every continent and in the oceans. Outside, two Toyota Land Cruisers come from an underground garage. Each car pulls up, driverless and silent. Men in safari uniforms open the doors. Regis directs the group. This way, everybody. This way. Two to four passengers to a car, please. Grant, Ellie, and Malcolm get into the first car. Tim and Lex get in the second car with Regis. Children under 10 must be accompanied by an adult. Tim whistles, entering the Land Cruiser. Mounted in the dashboard are two computer screens, a CD-ROM, a portable walkie-talkie, a radio transmitter, and odd goggles in the map pocket. The car starts off with an electrical hum. 
In the car ahead, the three scientists talk and gesture excitedly. In keeping with non-polluting policies of Jurassic Park, these lightweight electric Land Cruisers have been specially built for us by Toyota in Osaka. So now, just sit back and enjoy the self-guided tour. A trumpet fanfares, and the interior screens flash. Welcome to Jurassic Park. You are now entering the lost world of the prehistoric past, a world of mighty creatures long gone from the face of the earth, which you are privileged to see for the first time. The passengers look forward expectantly as they pass a palm grove. The trees to your left and right are called cycads, prehistoric predecessors of palm trees. Cycads were a favorite food of the dinosaurs. You also see benetitalians and ginkgos. The Jurassic world included more modern plants, such as pine trees and swamp cypress. Benetitalians. Pretty good. Ellie says, admiring the foliage. Regis smiles. We tried to be authentic. The land cruisers pass fences and retaining walls, screened by greenery to give the illusion of a real jungle. We imagine the dinosaurs as huge vegetarians, eating their way through the swampy forests of the Jurassic and Cretaceous world a hundred million years ago. But most dinosaurs were not as large as people think. The smallest dinosaurs were no bigger than a house cat, and the average dinosaur was the size of a pony. But for most people, the classic dinosaur is the sauropod, which we are going to see now. If you look to your left... The cars come to a stop as they all look intently to the left. Between massive tree trunks, a spectacular view. The sun sinks towards a misty horizon. The lagoon ripples in pink crescents. Tim points out over the view. There they are. They look out at the vista, but can only see a few silhouettes in the distance. Suddenly, the trees on the other side of the fence begin to move. A hadrosaur scampers away. Then, the hill beyond begins to rise. Two apatosaurs raise their long necks over 60 feet up in the air above the trees. The ground shakes as they walk. Their bellowing fills the air. My God. Ladies and gentlemen, Welcome to Jurassic Park. Led by Grant, the passengers rise through the open tops of the land cruisers to look up at the dinosaurs far above. The big animals you see are commonly called Brontosaurus, but they are actually Apatosaurus. Each animal weighs more than 30 tons, as much as a whole herd of elephants. They are the largest land animals in Earth's history. From the Apatosaurus head, leaves and branches fall down to Grant, who starts laughing in delight. An apatosaur cranes down to peer at the curious laughing man, continuously chewing its food. Its slow movements give it a solemn, judicious look. Grant's joy is infectious, and the others are smiling too. The apatosaur pauses, stares, and belches. Grant goes into hysterics, tears running down his cheeks. Lex stares up, unimpressed. Is he okay? Yes. He just never expected to see this. Uh, oh, it's true. I never expected to see d d dinosaurs. Me neither. My teacher told me they were extinct. Grant tries to match her seriousness. Mine too. I was sure they were extinct. And he begins laughing again. I'll tell you one thing, though. I wouldn't want to clean up after them. Grant is laughing harder than ever. This place is going to make a fortune. We think so. Regis looks to Malcolm. Fantastic, isn't it? I must say, yes. Bloody fantastic. As the dinosaurs move away, the trees branched above crack. Giant limbs fall close to the fence. The huge legs block and reveal what looks like a green parking meter in the jungle. It's a motion sensor. It blinks at the passing animals. In the car, the dashboard transmitter lights blink. The CD-ROM whirs, and the screens show images of apatosaurs. Now that we've had a look at these remarkable herbivores, we're going to move on to some dinosaurs which are quite a bit more dangerous. The carnivores. 
the Land Cruisers continue through the park. Inside the control room, Arnold sits at the console. Hammond watches the monitors. Look at them. They love it. It's a dream come true. It must be for Grant and Ellie. Grant doesn't know what hit him. <laughs> Fantastic. Those beautiful animals. Oh, I've waited for this day. Hmm. I think we should move the fences back a little further. Those tree branches almost hit the road. Arnold speaks into the intercom. Transmissions are overheating. Have maintenance check the electric clutches on vehicles BB-4 and BB-5 when they come back. Yes, Mr. Arnold. You seem a little tense, John. Arnold pushes his chair back, decidedly stubbing out a cigarette. You know, this is the first time we've actually had visitors tour the park. There's no problem, is there? Of course not. But you know... He lights another cigarette. First time the roller coaster goes around the loops, it can be a little tense. Those are my grandkids out there. Is there something you're not telling me? No, Mr. Hammond. I just want it to go right. And it is. I've got no problems as long as we keep those raptors out of the park. They're just too dangerous. I took your recommendation on that. The raptors are in the holding pen, aren't they? That's right. But I still think they should be destroyed. Oh, no, John. I do too. <laughs> Wu interjects, entering the room. Aren't you two overreacting? We're going to feed them in five minutes. You want to come down there, Mr. Hammond, and look at them again. Because to tell you the truth, they worry me. Hammond hesitates. <sighs> he doesn't want to miss the reaction of the people on the tour. Good idea. We've got ten minutes before they hit the Jungle River anyway. In the afternoon sun... Hammond stands with Wu before a holding pit sunk in the ground. An electric winch lowers a carcass of meat. Looking down, they see movement in the foliage below, but no animals. How many raptors do we have now, Henry? Five. They're highly intelligent, as smart as chimps. They have dexterity with their claws. They're pack hunters like wolves, quick and extremely vicious. In the foliage, their movement grows frantic as the meat descends. Vicious because they attacked a few careless construction workers when they escaped their paddock? If you remember, we lost four hadrosaurs in the week it took us to capture them. We think they even killed two of their own because we never found them. They must be dead because they never showed up on our motion sensors. The carcass reaches the bottom. Still mostly hidden, the raptors viciously attack it with their claws and rapacious teeth. The cables holding the meat swing back and forth wildly. It's a feeding frenzy. As for the dinosaurs, I think Dr. Grant may be of assistance in helping us to better understand the raptor's natural behavior. I hope so. They pose a real problem, more than any of the others. These carnivores behave like pack hunters, but even after feeding, they never calm down. As they continue to speak, the carcass rises from the pen, a dripping skeleton of bones and tire supports. From the pit, one clawed hand reaches up to grip the rising winch unnoticed. Wu follows Hammond around the rim of the pit. We just have to work on their environment. It's up to us, Henry, to find a more inventive way of keeping them under control. I'm afraid they really don't respond well to any form of captivity. Suddenly, the snarling raptor hits the fence in a blaze of sparks. Ah! Hammond jumps back. The raptor is right in front of him, hissing in a fury of exploding sparks. The raptor falls back. Accurate smoke hangs in the air. They do that all the time. Hit the fence, take a shock. Their behavior is quite unstable. I don't think we should try to breed any more complete strands of Velociraptor DNA. For the first time, a look of concern shows on Hammond's face. Perhaps you're right. 